So you may be thinking of kidney stone removal um, if you've developed some pains in your back, um, a kidney stone has been found incidentally on scanning. You might be getting recurrent urinary tract infections or even seeing blood in your urine. The most painful presentation of kidney stones is when they drop into the ureter, which we'll talk about later. There are four major ways to remove kidney stones. The first um, and least invasive is a method called extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. And it uses high frequency sound waves targeted at the stone to break it into very small fragments. It's then up to the body to pass these from the kidney all the way down uh, the various tubes and out of your body in the urine. It's safe to say it's the most preferred treatment by most people since it's truly minimally invasive. It takes around 35 to 45 minutes, depending on your mobility, um, and it's done whilst the patient is totally awake. Uh, and we often run it as a clinic based treatment. However, there's some caveats to this treatment. It only really works on stones that are really softer. Often I give this treatment to stones that are less than a centimetre. Um, and the stones themselves in the kidney have to be in a favourable position. I, the analogy I use is different positions of the tree. Um, and it, sometimes some areas uh, in the tree where the apple is make it quite difficult to target the ultrasound waves too. And therefore, either we may not be able to reach them or even if we reach them, the stone doesn't fall. The other thing is that the ultrasound probe is placed on your skin and it feels a little bit like a rubber, a rubber band flicking your skin. So if there is quite a lot of distance between the skin to the stone, if you're carrying a little bit of cushioning around your back, then the waves cannot penetrate as well uh, and the stone doesn't break down. And then the few instances where we cannot give shockwave lithotripsy is when you're on treatment uh, to thin your blood because there's a much higher risk of bleeding. If you have an aneurysm, basically a, a swelling of one of the blood vessels in your uh, abdomen, your tummy, or indeed if you're pregnant. So ES, ESWL can work in stones in the kidney, but they can also work in the pipe when they just dropped into the top of the pipe or when they're at the bottom, but not really in between because the pipe goes quite deep inside your abdomen, it's quite difficult to identify exactly where the stone is on ultrasound. So that's the first approach. So the second approach is called a flexible ureteranoscopy and laser fragmentation. So that's a big mouthful, but essentially means passing a very small, tiny, around three to four millimeter calibre uh, flexible camera all the way through your water pipe through your urethra, into your bladder, and then into your ureter, which is the tube that connects your kidney to your bladder. We traverse that and enter into your kidney. We use a very tiny laser to fragment the stones and we'll either turn, it in, turn them into dust and they will wash out by themselves. Or if the stone itself is quite hard, then we will use a very tiny basket that will pass through the, cam uh, through the scope and extract all the little fragments. This is an active way of removal of the stone fragments as opposed to a more passive way where you, the patient, is encouraged to drink water to hope that the fragments from lithotripsy, the procedure that we talked about before, uh, will pass by themselves. But there are some few disadvantages to this treatment. The first one is that it's under general anaesthetic, but it's a normal, it's normally a day case procedure. The second one is that the pipe itself, the ureter, is quite tight. It's roughly two to three millimetres in calibre itself. And in some people, we can't ascend and we have to leave a little plastic tube, which is effectively like a flexible straw that sits in the kidney and at the bottom end sits in the bladder. And that's a, uh, the hope is to allow the ureter to dilate open, but then you'll need a second procedure. Even if the ureter 
can dilate to allow the camera up after the procedure because we've been up in the kidney we will need to leave a stent behind this is first of all to allow adequate drainage of the kidney and also to ensure if there, if there are any little fragments that are left behind they can pass down the pipe without blocking the stent itself can give you symptoms of a urinary tract infection unfortunately so burning when you pass urine so called dysuria blood in the urine and pain in the back now 80 percent of people experience varying degrees of symptoms from this stent and there's a lucky 20 percent of people one in five approximately that don't feel anything but the majority of our patients particularly the younger ones experience some difficulty with this stent the stent doesn't stay in permanently and it comes out anywhere between one two three days uh, to six weeks afterwards depending on how well the procedure has gone um, and whether there are any residual stones left the flexible ureteronoscopy is best used in stones that are not too large and not too small um, it's also quite a good option if you've got stones in both kidneys that need treatment or stones in multiple areas of the kidney where you can take all the stones in one sitting this is less favorable than shockwave where you can only treat one stone in one position at each time so moving on to the third approach which is perhaps the most invasive and highest risk but arguably the greatest reward procedure and that is a percutaneous so through the skin nephrolithotomy into the kidney and breaking down the stone uh, and this is effectively keyhole but in what you would normally describe in your head as or what you would think as keyhole which is a cut on the skin about the size of a of a biro so something like something like this um about a centimeter diameter um through the structures of the abdomen into the kidney this is done under uh, radiology uh, and often with a, a consultant radiologist by the surgeon's side to obtain access into the kidney this procedure uh, allows us to pass a camera into the kidney and because we're using a larger camera with larger channels we can use effectively a pneumatic drill to break down stones and then suck them all out often this procedure is reserved for people with very large stones so anything over a centimeter and a half to four or five centimeters or indeed for people who may not have normal anatomy in their lower urinary tract and actually we can't pass we can't pass a camera all the way up into the kidney because of its because we're not using the natural tubes of the body the risks are higher because we could damage uh, some of the organs as we try and get to the kidney itself but we reduce the risk by using two different modalities uh, or imaging uh, to make sure that we're not harming any other parts of the body as we go in and that is an ultrasound and x-rays to get into the kidney afterwards you might be expected to uh, have a drain that comes out of your kidney and that's occasionally put that in about one in three people and again some people have stents put in through the back down into their bladder to allow little fragments to to clear this is often an overnight and sometimes a two-night stay in hospital the final approach is quite a use uh, a unique one in that there are five major types of kidney stone and although all of them can be treated effectively with the first three options i've talked about there is only one type uh, that can be removed by dissolution treatment um, and that's effectively dissolving the stone these types of stones are formed in acidic uh, urine and by treating your urine or you ingesting some either fluid or tablets to alkalinize the urine it effectively dissolves the stone uh, and i've seen large three four centimeter stones being dissolved with chemical dissolution treatment the problem is that there's a lot of stuff out there online uh, and word of mouth that uh, tells you to have this medication or 
take this tablet or this herb that will dissolve the stones. But you need to be aware that most people will not have this type of stone. It's only around five to ten percent of people that do. So be aware of that before uh, taking anything over the counter. The most painful presentation of kidney stones is when, and I've alluded to this before, uh, when a stone drops into the ureter. I've already mentioned that the ureter itself is around three millimeters in caliber. So if you've got a, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a three millimeter or larger stone, it could be a two millimeter stone that causes just as much pain. But when they drop, it's equivalent, uh, I've been told, to childbirth. And uh, it's the worst pain that most people will feel in, in their lives. Um, it is a medical emergency and you need to uh, seek some help. And most likely you will have a scan called a CT scan, which will identify the size of the stone and the position. And depending on both of these, we can decide whether we will be able to treat you with a laser or whether we might be able to treat you with shockwave lithotripsy. But the majority of people uh, will require a ureteric stent if they are going to have laser treatment.